<clears throat> way woe. 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 What are you working on? What are you working on? What are you What are you What are you What are you working on? Whoa. Well. Hello, Diane. Hello, Diane. <coughs> Diane's a little. Diane number two is a little. Uh, <laughs> I said I wouldn't cough into the mic. She's a little sick today. Ugh. What happened? Is it bird flu? It's it is uh, another strain of avian flu. Damn. It's like, I can't even make jokes because the punchline <laughs> is cut off by this cough. It's one of by those. A cough. It's one of those coughs where it's just like, it, it, well, I do have a sore throat, but the cough is like unrelated. Yeah, I'm just kind of tagging along for the ride. Um, <laughs> it threw in some gas money for the ride, and then it's like, let's go. Yeah. Oh, I heard you guys are going on tour. Are you doing some gigs in Boston? Can I yeah. come? And they're like the sore throats reluctantly, like, yeah, sure. The sore throats. That's the punk band. Yeah. <laughs> It would be. I, I feel like there probably is out there. They still have a MySpace. They're in like Czech Republic. That's cool. Yeah. Hello. We ahoy. We are the sword. That's how you say hello in, in, in Czech, by the way. Ahoy. Ahoy. I don't know if that in the ahoy, emphasis is on ahoy or throats. ahoy. Like, I don't know if it actually comes from sailors or if sailors took it from them, but it's one of my favorite ways to say hello. But ahoy, we are the sword throats. Woo! They're all their, all their fans. I'm, yeah, I, I'm a group. <clears throat> That's us. I was there for that Madison Square Garden concert. Yeah, yeah. You and me, and they were the they were the roadies for Ramstein. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna they, call they got canceled from the Guar tour, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anywho, uh, hope, hope you're all doing great out there. Hi, everybody. Hope your <laughs> <laughs> hope your week's better than uh, hope you're doing Greg. Better than me. Um, but you know, this is how much I love this thing. Episode two. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm dedicated. Wet nurse or not, you're here. Exactly. Everyone, attention. There was a that space That edit's going to sound so horrible. There was a space heater on. Just wanted to let everybody know that there was, well, there was a ghost, but we chased it away. Yeah. And there was a space heater on, well, so that's I, what that noise was. I tried to fuck the ghost, but <clears> it <throat> it flew away. Busting makes you feel good. <laughs> is that what that line is about, by um, the way? Like I know it's I know it's obviously a euphemism Ray Parker Jr. came up with, but like it's a sex euphemism, right? It's not like I <coughs> would incline to say so. Yeah, he ain't afraid of no ghost. Mm. Um, yeah, you know that uh, this is a total tangent, but it's a good thing to you know put out there for the people is that the overall tune of um, Ghostbusters was stolen from "I Want a New Drug" by Huey Lewis on the News, one of my favorite bands. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a huge legal battle, too. Um, and I think we know who the better man was. We, we know. And he's got some news, so. Uh-huh. But actually, like, can you th- can you name another Ray Parker Jr. song? Um. Wow, no. I'm thinking a situation like there's a gun to my head, and I, I can't. That was actually, yeah, that was it. That was his other platinum single. There's, there's a, a gun, gun to, to my head. head. Yeah, 1987. Uh, I teamed up with Meatloaf for that one. Wow, that'll yeah. be my wedding song. <laughs> I really want to hear that song. Now. Like slow down 800%, <laughs> just slow dancing to that. That's cool. Anywho, so I hope that everybody out there is doing better than me and if you are sick then, you know, comrades Then in. call in and tell us yeah. what you're <laughs> call, call just cough into the mic. Yeah. <laughs> call a cough into your phone uh and, Yeah, call my uh, hotline and cough mm-hmm. and then hang up. What's the number again? I think it's one eight hundred hot talk T A W K. Yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, sure it'll be busy. <coughs> uh, so busy. Um, but now that we've said hello to the listeners out there, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm yeah. not sick. Um, so that's good. That is good. I'm really scared. I'm going to get you sick. Not just not necessarily from I don't this get recording, sick. but <laughs> you're actually. I don't think I've ever seen you sick. And if I do, I I hide it really well. Mm. Yeah, I don't. I let the, I let you, you unleash know. the inner bear grills. <laughs> I become Nurgle, the plague god. You piss in a garbage can. I did just do that. It wasn't because. Well, it was because I'm sick. I've drank so much water today, which is good. Which it's is good. What you're I just to do. I need to pee a lot, and uh, yeah, we we're so close, but we, <laughs> we're so close. But I just. I had to pee all over your mailbox. I'm I made sorry. it on time, actually. I didn't really need to pee, but when I saw those trash cans in a dark <laughs> corner, I just had to let loose. Um, I don't blame you for that. Yeah, no, I um, I get very survivalist when uh, my bladder is calling, 
Um, mm. I like I will drop everything. I don't care if I'm walking in a group of people. I will just bounce. I'll just Irish goodbye it. Find a place where I need to do what I got to do, whether it's a Starbucks, Barnes and Noble bathroom, and just let that and, hot stream of orange fucking. How dehydrated fluid. do you think I usually am? <laughs> <clears throat> No, I have a strange disorder that converts my urine into orange soda. It's called <laughs> Kel Mitchell's disease. <gasps> oh, my God. God. Is WebMD on this? WebMD is how I got diagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to the real anyway, question. How are you? I'm doing really well. What? Why Why are you well? Wh- wh- why? Why? <laughs> why are you well? I'm well because... Um, I have been doing a lot of rewrites to my script recently, yep. and I think I am whittling it down to a very fine, fine, detailed um, piece of work. And I think I'm I'm very close to almost being done. Well, so before I even ask you more questions, I should ask the the question of of questions. Wait, whoa, wait, whoa. So, wait, whoa. What are you working on? What are you working on? Well, same as uh, what I was working on last week. You so know. you're working on this screenplay. Obviously, we got a little bit of a spoiler in there. Um, yeah. But so now we can ask a little bit more just about that process. Don't need to necessarily get into the story unless yeah. there's like one kind of little nugget that you want to share about it. But uh, Shrimp. There's there's shrimp involved. Okay. <laughs> is, is this Forrest Gump 2? Because we've been waiting. And it's just all I'm about, about him running that restaurant really. chain, the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'll ask. I'll ask some very kind of logistic questions about it. Sure. What's your runtime right now? What's What's your length of? Ooh, that sounds weird out of context. Uh, what is your girth of script? <laughs> script girth. <laughs> How many pages? Well, is your script right now? Um, one hundred and four pages. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's a it's a nice length. It's not too long not too short um it's got a good weight yeah it's got a solid your hand girth. when you yeah yeah when i just slap it on the table it's like pow good hour and 48 minutes or whatever <coughs> you know yeah there are, I, it's it's a very phallic um it's a I've, phallic it's a pretty world. phallic industry i guess i mean it's been run by men too yeah. too long but um I find that that comedy is also a pretty phallic industry when you're talking about it. Like it is just just, and, it, just image-wise, the, the kind of holding of a mic, and even like you know, even from my perspective, even though I am a male, I am a gay male. So it, it, there is sort of this like weird, like I don't fully feel like I'm accepted into like the club, but like I think through my own work and merit. That I have been, I have been given some level of respect, but I don't think I have reached a full level of respect entirely because they still sort of see like a gimmicky thing. Interesting, you know, I sort of not. So even I don't, re- I don't totally feel like I'm like I don't fit in. I mean, no, I I've proven myself plenty of times, mm-hmm. but I still sort of feel that there may be sort of this like gimmicky thing that people don't necessarily take as seriously. In the fact of like. Oh well, you know, like like the movie comes out, or whatever. It's like, yeah, I thought it was fine. Well, you know that the screenwriter's gay, or like, oh. or like it's a gay movie. You yeah, know, I'm using air quotes. You know, it's like, well, yeah, that is one aspect of it. Yeah, but it's not. I the... feel like recently there was a quote unquote gay movie that like it. A friend of mine, who's also in the LGBTQ plus community, um, was like, please stop calling it a gay movie. It's just a movie. Yeah, I mean. I mean, this, you know, that's sort of this whole identity politics thing. It's like, I appreciate queer characters and diversity, but you don't need to pigeonhole it in a in a gay movie category. I've always wanted to write uh, just a solid action thriller where the protagonist is a gay man. Uh, and it's just like, that's just a matter of fact thing. Yeah. Sissy Boomba. Pew, pew. <laughs> Just dodging bullets. No, like no, just like it's no, just, it's like just nothing. It's, it's, it's like I'm just, being just one of the. It's like it's not even mentioned necessarily. Like, like I personally find the romantic interest in an action movie to be distracting sometimes. Not like I like to have an asexual action movie, but asexual just, action. Figures. I mean, there, yeah. come on, <laughs> just asexual James Bond. <laughs> Mister Bond, you look quite nice today. 
Thank you. Anyway, so Thanks, can you help me find Goldfinger <laughs> or not? Anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, just I've always wanted to write just a gay protagonist who it, it's such a small part of his character. Like maybe it's just on the one sheet about him. Yeah. Maybe he's even married. So it's like there's just that that whole pursuit thing mm-hmm. is on the table and just like focusing on the mystery. Husband's he's just a... like, when you coming home? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But see, then even if you were to do that, like I think I was telling you there was a sitcom that came out. It has to be like 10 years ago or so uh, starring Ian McKellen. And I think his first name is Michael Jacoby who you would recognize his face, British actor, also similar age to Ian McKellen. And they did a sitcom on BBC uh, or maybe Channel 4 where it was just like, oh, look at this old gay couple. They're like catty, but it's really just that they're an old couple. But the gag is that they're a gay couple. Yeah, I I think I remember seeing that. I mean, it was very well acted and it seemed fun. But, you know, it was a laugh track sitcom. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I want a laugh track horror film <laughs> starring I'm, Ian McKellen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, just going to have a coughing fit over here. We're going to produce that while Greg coughs mm-hmm. everywhere. How amazing would that be if like, you were rich enough that you really could green light whatever you wanted oh at any God. moment? Oh my God. I would make such ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> I truly would. God forbid if uh, Bill Gates ever decides to start producing movies, because he's the only one who really could be like, "How much is it going to cost? Two hundred fifty mil? Okay, all right, I'll do a payment plan, but we'll we'll do it." What I just made it back. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, do whatever you want for marketing. I don't care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do VOD. Um, <laughs> but so back to your feature. Yes. So. So besides this kind of uh, trying to shake off the, um, I don't know, the the identity element. That's a minor thing. That's yeah. like a side thing that I'm not even concerned about. It's just that's more of a general <clears throat> thought. But um, I feel really good about it. And um, I'm feeling um, proud of myself that I'm really like diving deep into a really rich, complex, you know, um, character driven conflict riddled um piece and i feel really happy i feel like i personally feel like there's been growth within myself and i think that that's a sign of a successful project for sure um how long did it take you to write the first draft i'm guessing the first draft took you longest or maybe your second Um, i think the yeah the first draft probably took me the longest that was probably like when did i start like it took me like a solid month to okay. get to get a first draft. Sure. Yeah. I mean that's very good. I when I humble Thank brag you. was hired uh when I humble brag was hired to uh write a script on spec, I don't know, like three geez, no, like five years a ago. T V spec or a s uh no, no, feature. Oh. Um cool. I think I've told you that story for like a crazy lady. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, I love like eccentric rich people who just me like too. I want you to write a movie about me and Marlon Brando and it's not going to be seen by anyone and I except will, my dog and I will there's a scene in which I want to fuck him on the balcony can we CGI that in, in can a, we do it in post in a wheelbarrow uh, <laughs> I, I call it of mice and men and Marlon <laughs> um, anyhow uh, I was writing that script for this woman and the timeline I had given her was three months and which is fair <laughs> i think that's fair yeah i have a bad procrastination habit when i'm not feeling totally inspired by a project that so i only wrote act one in the first month and then i didn't do anything for the second month and i finished the whole script in two weeks before it was due oh wow yeah. <laughs> you really cranked it out <laughs> well you know when i have to but i was lucky because i kind of struck uh imaginative gold yeah uh, at the, well, the last minute I can totally relate because when you do hit that like G spot creatively, it's just like you're on a train that is just on fire. Bam! You are going into the. It station. is really weird. You kind of black out. Um, yes, you. It's almost like nothing around you matters, and you're just like. Hey, listeners, uh, send us a message on Instagram or Facebook and tell us about a time you've blacked out. Please, non- non-specific to creativity. Yeah. <laughs> Send us a picture of your G spot, and then I, yeah. one of the two. <laughs> um, 
We your creative G spot. Yes, yes. Hello. Um, but I had, you yeah. recently sold a painting, right? I did. I, I recently made a deal for a painting. Uh, that I will be handing off next next week, next weekend, something like that. Congrats! Um, thank you, thank you. I need that money. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I I need a dollar, dollar, dollar is all I need. Um, oh my! Aloe black. Uh, but no, it's, it feels good. I haven't sold a piece in a while. Um, and back in the swing of things, it's uh, I guess I. So this is something we wanted to talk about today, which is kind of how do you measure success? So you finished this. This draft, uh, would you say it's the final draft? Are you gonna the latest draft that I finished? Yeah, no, I probably need to do at least one more, if not another. But but the amount of work that needs to be done, I feel like I'm ninety eight percent there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like a little pinch of salt. Put the put the fresh parsley on top. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of thing. I feel like it's really close. Like really, really close. Sure. So in that regard, I feel successful. That's good. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, so that's one kind of measurement or one metric that, that we have to discuss today. For me, so I feel weird about the sale. Um, yeah. Because on the one hand, <coughs> and then I collapse. Uh, He's on the floor now. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, it's great to make a sale. Yeah. Uh, I'm planning to travel a little bit so i'm trying to build up a savings etc cetera, etc cetera. and um and just in general i mean you know it's nice that somebody said i like this enough to buy it it's great that's a lovely feeling but i did bring the price down a lot like several hundred dollars oh um that being said so there's like you know some ups and downs to the story uh i am selling it to a friend who i really trust with it that's a big thing for me and i want to talk about this kind of in terms of success is like who gets it who buys it from you or kind of uh, you know down the road who watches listens or or kind of absorbs benefits who your audience is so with paintings it's a really interesting thing because unless it's a gallery or a museum there's really going to only be one assured audience unless i see a situation like say example for example, you had a piece in your home, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Ooh, Greg, who did that?" And you're like, "Oh, this is so and so." Yeah. Then maybe it's sort of like a word of mouth, I'm like, "Oh, sure. I like that artist." Well, yeah. Um, but uh, I'm a perfectionist, and I'm like way too neurotic, so every piece is like, "I need to know." Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how did you feel about especially this one? But so I'm really happy that I'm selling it to this person who I think is really going to respect it. It's a, I mean. It's a pretty intimate painting for me. It's 24 inches by 18. It's inspired by some Jewish mystical aspects and, and kind of the parts of, of the Torah of the Old Testament that I really kind of, uh, I don't know, like it just, it's very close to my heart. And so it was a very personal piece. So I'm really glad that this, this friend of mine is going to have it in his home. I think he can really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I, I never want my the money aspect to kind of control how I feel about it. Film, it's a lot easier to let the money kind of dictate things. But ultimately, so I have kind of two successes in that I sold a painting and I sold it to the right person, but it's a little bit of a dampener that it's not for its full or value. original value. Yeah. But so here's a question I want to pose back to you about your script. Um, let's say... A producer. Uh, okay, you have two choices. Here you go. And this is something to think about for Sophie's any choice. any any listener that that my, I'm sure you've been in this predicament or you will be. Um, yeah. So get ready. You're being optioned by two people. Okay. One is like, at least in in my book, like an A24 style, smaller production studio that really takes care to a degree of. Um, you know, whatever whatever properties they, they end up using um, or turning into a film. Uh, but the money is just not as much as the other person who's optioning it, which is something like an MGM. Well, MGM doesn't exist anymore, but Sony uh, or Universal or something like that. And they're going to just give you a buttload of money. You know, it would be it would depend on the 
um, details um, of the terms and conditions of the contract. Sure. But if someone like A24 approached me, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to take that. Yeah. Because they're, they're incredible. They're fantastic. My movie, I mean, not to brag or anything, but my script I think would work perfectly in the world that is the sensibility of A24. Okay. Um, I can also see like, I can also see like a new line cinema because they kind of used mm -hmm. to be a little bit more experimental back in the day. Yeah. You know, they're like a, little... a focus features. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lion's gate. Well, they're doing a bunch of different stuff now, and there's a lot of Chinese investment with yeah. Lion Gate, yeah. Lionsgate. But um, okay, so let me make this even uh, more complex. So there's your first two options. Is there a donkey involved? <laughs> what I'll if, fuck a donkey. What if uh, a rich oil baron riding on a donkey <laughs> um, came into your hometown? Came, just rode on up to your <laughs> home studio and was like, hey, you. I heard you make movies. Uh, What's it to you? I hear, I hear you make the moving pictures. Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> can't can't do anything. He's okay. on the floor again. Oh god, I'm rolling around. Um, <laughs> but so this rich oil baron comes to you and he's like, "Look, I'm trying to diversify my portfolio. I want to get invested in in, uh, in the movies." In the movie pictures, in the movins, <laughs> in the moving, in the movins. How come that never happened? They never called them movings. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's find out. No, Roll we, don't, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so this guy and he, you know, he's totally inexperienced, mm -hmm, but has a shitload of money. But he's got a lot of money, and because he's inexperienced, he's just like, "Hey, man, I just like that script I saw on the blacklist, and I think that it's got legs." Like, you tell me what you need from me and it's yours so kind of putting the agency back on you but it's way riskier if, if it's it, gonna even it get flops. finished yeah 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 so would you would what about that one i would draft a proposal with my entertainment lawyer and this individual this tycoon and say i will bring you on as a consultant or a investor of some kind in which we work out some kind of financial deal. Yeah. Um, basically, like, you would be credited as executive producer because you have given X amount of money, and then we come up with some kind of deal with distribution, theatrical release, all of Sure, that. sure, sure. You know? Um, that's what I would propose to this individual. Yeah. Because, listen, Joe Schmo, oil tycoon, donkey rider, I'm sure, you know... He could have a passion for something and have all the money in the world, but if they don't know how the process works, the business end of it, then well, that's what I dealt with with my script. It was yeah. just, I mean, and it's you, still well, going get, on. You get these like, you get these people that are like, you know, I, I want to commission mean these people. These people. <laughs> well, okay, excuse me. These people meaning like wealthy people that have no experience in any no, sort true. of creative or artistic business sense. And they 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 reach out to someone like you or I, and they say, "Well, this is what I want. Can you make this yeah. happen?" It's like, well, you have to be a little realistic here and realize that like you come from another world, and not that what you want is impossible, but you just don't have the nuanced understanding and experience that is required to f produce this in a, in a way that would be um, the most successful. Like I don't know you. No, I know what you mean. I've had a bad history of um, herpes. Well, that too. No, yeah. I don't have herpes. Don't worry, everybody. Only syphilis. But we don't care if you um, do. Which is Al Capone died of syphilis, right? Was uh, he was shot in the head by. He was not uh, shot. No, I'm, I was making a joke. but oh. you ruined it. I'm a big. I was, I'm a I big was, Al Capone. I was truther. Gonna, <laughs> I was going to say Al Capone was shot in the head by Fidel Castro and John F. Kennedy. Oh, but no, that's true. Okay. He survived that though, and then he died of syphilis. <laughs> You're right. Excuse me. Redact yeah. that. <laughs> um. <coughs> <laughs> oh God! All this cough syrup. Um. Pass it around. You know. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Uh, I've had a bad history of working for in these kind of projects, and yeah. if you're listening and you're kind of 
you know, because I have no idea who's going to find this podcast. I really don't. Hopefully, but... the, hopefully, <laughs> mentally ill people and and the incarcerated. <laughs> the Waywo podcast told me to follow you. Um, <laughs> God. Um, but uh, no, I, if you're out there and you haven't really taken the leap yet, um, or you're kind of still like fresh out of school or whatever it is, um, or you just feel like you're new to it, um, don't not take the rich people gigs and what i mean by rich people gigs is like they don't really have any affiliation to anything where their company is like you've never heard of it um just be aware of what you're getting yourself into and make sure you don't undersell yourself um but because the mental headache is like worth an extra 200 300 dollars it can be it can be but you have to determine that for yourself and what you're comfortable and capable of but ultimately i mean experience is experience and even if you don't necessarily produce something that you like, it's an opportunity for you to sell yourself. It's an opportunity for you to refine your deal-making skills and how you can come to the table with an offer and how you can sort yeah. of present yourself professionally. And I do kind of feel like of those who can't do teach teacher right now because it's like, you know, we're not famous. So it's like, why listen to us? But I mean, both of us have seen these kind of things before. So if I can give a piece of advice to the folks out there, um, it's just like you're going to fuck up. You're going to make some economic mistakes. Um, and you really just live and learn. I beat myself about it, up about it a lot. Um, but He's covered in bruises. Covered in bruises constantly. Why? Why? That's script. Um, <laughs> but uh, if there's any like real small uh, tidbit of advice that's like a very concrete piece of advice that I learned um, from uh, a very talented director, I'm very happy he taught me this. When you write a script and you're going to show it to someone, even if they're just like, I'll read it, uh, do one of two things. If you're a screenwriter, register it with the Writers Guild. Yes. It's like fifteen bucks. Yeah. Do it. Well, twenty five if you're a non member, seventeen oh, okay. if you're a student. Oh, okay. Ten if you're a member. Got it. So my number was just completely off. <laughs> Greg's like, it's thirty dollars. <laughs> no, it's changed since my day. Uh, <laughs> um, register with the guild, you, mm-hmm. and yeah, you don't have to be a guild member. And uh, if you're a playwright, you can do that too. But if you want to save a little bit of money, uh, mail your script to yourself. Do you know that trick? I've heard of that, yeah. It's not necessarily the, the most surefire thing, but it does stand up in a court of law. Um, and because what it when you mail your script to yourself, you now have an official government record that the script is yours. Yep. That, an, that, a, that a copy existed. And you don't open it. Don't ever open it. Um, but you have let proof it that... Yeah, just let it disintegrate. Um, but uh, And then bring the mulch to court. Uh when Ray Parker Jr. steals it. <gasps> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's a fun little uh, piece of advice that I and, try to teach And when the people, government decides to folks. get back into session, you can get your work copyrighted. Copy yes, written. there's always the copyright option, but how much does it cost? I mean... Um, I don't know how much it costs. I know it takes a good six weeks for it to process. Yeah. But... Um, and you don't you don't necessarily need to do that right away, but if you have a little time and a little bit extra money, it really can certainly help you. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, and they're very important. They it's, really it are. It seems like such a headache, or it's like, oh, come on, trust. But and I'm a very and age, trusting person. But in this day and age, people can steal from you. And I'm not I'm not paranoid. It's just about like being honest about. Yeah, I just what know who happened. you're sending it to. I mean, exactly. Alex sends me yeah. his drafts, and I've stolen every single one of them, but. Uh, yeah, I saw this weird TV show that got produced about shrimp and poop and <laughs> Well, stuff. my first my first and big hit. I was like hit, that looks so familiar. My first big hit on uh on on the Broadway stage was <laughs> was a was a a memoiristic one man show called My Name is Alex Zaccaro. <laughs> and uh it, it's it, it, it did it did it did okay. People didn't really find me believable as a thin uh, Italian American gay man, but I I did my best. Uh, <laughs> Would you call yourself last week? Cat in the Hat meets. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I forgot how I Cat in the it. Hat plays an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw the show and it it really it sucked. It was. <laughs> it, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> 
uh, if I don't die of laughter, because that seems to be what's provoking this. <laughs> um, quick total tangent that I just I I just Please. remembered, and I really wanted to ask you about it earlier today. I've I've started getting increasingly irritated with how people talk on Facebook, and I've already been pissed off with Facebook for years, but mm-hmm. and I still have a Facebook. I am a hypocrite, but. I keep seeing people write things like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen to like some stand-up video yeah. on YouTube that's just kind of floating around or whatever it is. I mean, there's like a t- one random tweet. And because I'm a 72-year-old man in a tw- 28-year-old's body, I've I been cranky. Too. I've been cranky like a long time and I've made a lot of these kids statements or kids these days statements. But seriously, the hyperbolic language sounds really fucking dumb. It's not the funniest. I mean, if it is, I like to imagine that it is the funniest thing that they've ever seen, because and they're simple. It it just, <laughs> just leads me to think that like, what a humorless life they've led. God, I'm like, you, you just want to comment? Do you get out enough? <clears throat> I mean, I just kind of want to be like, I don't know. I I just can I can I take you out for a meal? Uh, yeah, and well, tell you like old jokes to catch you up. Yeah. Um, or, or you know, inform you of genuinely, like, classically funny and interesting references. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with comedy nowadays is, like, you have so many ways to watch comedy or, or listen to it even from such an early age. Uh, and it's just coming at you constantly. So traditional joke tropes are old, quote, unquote, old by the time you're, like, 10. Yeah. Um, though I will say, did I tell you the joke? I do have students. One of my side hustles is that I teach, uh, I teach at a, at a Hebrew school at a synagogue or two synagogues in New York city. Um, I've got plenty of stories for later, but, oh boy, uh, some kids came up to me and they were like, Hey, do you want to hear a joke? And I was like, sure. Uh, how does a Jewish vampire or no, no, sorry. That's my joke. Fucked it up. How does the Jew, how does a Jewish guy make his coffee? He brews it. Hebrew, ha 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 ha. I think it look works better on a popsicle stick. Uh, great pun, cool. <laughs> Who's the king of uh, anticlimactic dad jokes? This guy. <laughs> and I say right back to them. Oh, you want to hear a joke? What do you call a Jewish vampire? Doctor Sidney Applebaum. <laughs> they just kind of <laughs> froze there, stared at me. I personally find it hilarious, and I will cite Bill Hader on that. I'm pretty sure, or John Mulaney. I'm pretty sure it's from a Stefan bit. But um, oh, Stefan. But my God, these kids were just like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, oh, you have much to learn. Yeah. Or you've already watched so much Tim and Eric that you, nothing, I know, unless it's the most extreme. It's it's kind of crazy. It's like, I, I couldn't imagine being a, a kid the, these days and it sounds so, makes me sound old, but it's like, they're so overwhelmed and yeah. in, in this oversaturated thing that, yeah, it's like that, not, nothing is funny. You know, yeah, and I mean the amount. Nothing of... is shocking anymore because it's like, oh yeah. And this kind of comes all. back to making stuff and measuring success. I I've always pushed myself to make something original, but I don't hate cliche or archetypes or anything. I just want to do it in a way that is respectful to the audience, and it's not just parody or it's not just homage. Like, have your own spin to it. Like, have a sense of personality to Quentin Tarantino. Perfect example. I mean, his only style is homage, and yet he does it in a way that is just remarkably unique. Um, But I was thinking about kind of with the influx of content, my least favorite word, just but stuff, that just sensory things um, at all times. And like, it doesn't surprise, I mean, it's a kind of a, it's a cycle of, of itself, but it doesn't surprise me that we don't have a lot of original scripts. And we have a lot of sequels, and this is not a new problem, it's just gotten worse, but like sequels and then tentpole movies that are based off of pre-existing content or materials, and like only 50% of them do well. Yeah. Because now not only are like screenwriters or writers rooms so pummeled with content that's get it kind of seeping into their brains, our brains, I mean me too, I'm not going to say I'm immune to this. Um, I just really tried to force it out by the second or third draft. Um, but yeah, it's just like, how do you have an original idea when essentially society is not letting you? Because there's always some thing being pushed at you, whether it's coming from a car or it's coming from your own Spotify or whatever it is. Um, well, 
there's the there's the idea that there's no original idea. Mm. You know, well, this goes back to uh, Joseph Campbell. Toot toot, toot toot. Get on the train. Get on that train. I, what I have to say to that is that is valid, but also, you know, you can take a story like a story about revenge, a story about love, a story about overcoming your fear. Right? These sort of overarching large themes that you see in so many yeah movies but how do you show that what's the nuanced fresh perspective that you're giving to it what exactly. sort of twists can you throw in there that aren't cliche mm-hmm. you know and there's so many ways to do it there's a visual way to do it which i find is actually the least effective i think even if something is visually spectacular if the script is lousy it usually doesn't hold up very well story is king Story is it is the backbone is is Come the script on. always it's, the script is the soul of the piece, and if your soul is shitty, you're going to hell. It, yep, no, that's just it. Um, it's decided by if you had to write a movie, and that's why <laughs> so many people fail. Yep, um, because none of us truly can. <laughs> Rosebud. Uh, but oh. um, yeah, I just was thinking about like it's a weird kind of tangent for my brain to go, but it went from seeing people. Like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and like, just like it? it's it's probably not at, or it's not going to be and just kind of one the simplicity of that that statement or just like people don't like to I'm not going to say people don't I won't make these kind of absolutist statements but trend wise people don't like to use a lot of words or they'll use a cluster of words that are popular that are in pop culture so like things just aren't just des- aren't described that kind of i don't know eloquently i'm definitely a big fan of stephen fry like let's use our our words and things that's a terrible stephen fry impression but the point being yeah he's, I thought it was great he's yeah, he advocates for like really like he advocates for swearing a lot because it's adds color to language and is swearing. using a lot of you know fucking words all the time a lot of fucking words man but if it's not like a political buzzword and political is really just code for angry angry entertainment um, but if it's not a political buzzword, then it's going to be an entertainment buzzword, um, like Gucci, uh, which I have oh, students that say God. that, and that's how everything is described, and then that seeps back into scripts and, and yeah, you and know, when, I mean, when you talk about the contemporary art world, the amount uh, of stuff that's coming out that really is just kind of homage to past artists, once again, not inherently bad, but also a lot of parody. There's so much kind of cynical art. There's so much kind of just let me take. A thing, and I'm guilty of this. I just try to really. I, I spend a lot of time on it before I finish it, and it could suck. I'm. I'm not saying I'm better than people here. Um, I just notice a lot of people in movies and art and music to a degree with style. They're just kind of taking something and not even putting a new spin on it. They're just kind of slapping their name on it in a way. Yep. And this is not and for podcast everyone. Done. No. This is not. <laughs> But this is not does not mean everyone is doing that. But there is no. a there is an overall trend of that. Yeah, I mean, do you consider that a success though? If somebody it, you know, if somebody were to be just success is relative to the individual. But basically, like for me, like if you find joy and satisfaction in your own work, or you're making money, or someone else enjoys what you do. Then it's successful. But then what about something like, let's find a pretty mutually disliked, I won't say hate, that's a strong word, but Hate's disliked strong. movie uh, that's from a pre-existing material um, that may, like, think in your mind of a movie that's just not well made, uh, that's got shitty dialogue, and that's based off of, like, a usually as a comic book, that made a buttload of money. Transformers. I, Transformers is a pretty good example, though one could say, like, Michael Bay is this auteur. He's the only one who could pull off those kind of large-scale effects, and that's why you go. I have a perfect example for it, and it's relevant because he just had a movie come out last weekend. Have you ever seen The Last Airbender by M. Night Shyamalan? Yes. Are you talking about what's the new one? The film, the live-action film version of the Nickelodeon series. Yes. What's his new one that just came out? He just came out with Glass. Glass, which was a follow-up to Split. So it's a follow-up to Split, which... it was a secret follow-up to Unbreakable, so that's cool. The Godfather um, to something else, probably. No, unfortunately, that was the first one. You tried, though. I know, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know your Shyamalan. I used to. Yeah. Um, 
you you knew Lady it the, in the whole water. time. I am just quick tangent before we, I rip into Last Airbender. Um, I had a period of time where I really liked that movie, Lady in the Water. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it was something about the tree monkeys that come at the end of the movie. Uh, I literally changed my AIM screen name. I don't know why I put literally, but I changed my AIM screen name to be Tartutic 1700 because I loved it so much. And it's not a good movie. Uh, not as worse. That's the one with, um, uh, with what's his name uh, from Boston. What's his name? Wahlberg. What's what? No. Wahlberg. No. no. He, there's, it's just, he's so poorly acted. Um, but, uh, so Shyamalan did The Last Airbender. Yeah. And it made a shit ton of money. Like, so much money. That's... Because they people love that. Um... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And I think it totally took advantage of that, and I mean that in, not in a good way. Like, it, it, it totally just... Oh, it's so cruel to do that to something that was original. I mean, The Last Airbender, that series, that kids series, air quotes on kids, uh... Like that got me through my my final year of college. It was so good. Um, got so many ideas flowing. Just the animation's great and the characters. Um, and then this shitty, shitty adaptation comes out that tries to cram like six seasons of twenty episodes each or something. I don't know. It's a lot of episodes. Tries to cram that all into one, uh, one movie that I don't even think was epically long. I think it was probably like a, like maybe two hours. Uh, the casting is totally off, uh, except for maybe Dev Patel as Zuko, which is, whenever I hear your name, I think of Zuko yeah. from Last Airbender. But anyway, to get out of ripping into the movie specifically for its content, just for its kind of its existence in the zeitgeist, it's a financial success that I don't consider a successful film. Yeah, I think that it's. I mean, it's some people just hate it, like legitimately hate it, um, or like Ghostbusters was my childhood hated it when the new one came out, which I like kind of roll my eyes to, but yeah, um, they feel something. But just like I can't explain how bad of a movie it is. Just technically, it's so poorly carried out, um, and the only thing that it can really claim is the money. Yeah. That's not success for me. But you know there there is someone out there who doesn't care about the quality or the art itself. They care about how much I'm going to get in return on this. You know, there there is somebody who that's all they care about. So, to them, that is a success. Yeah. I mean, my dad is that. He's the the perfect consumer. He refuses to see anything that's not in IMAX 3D now, and so sometimes it's, that's his rule. Yeah, he oh, always dear. it's awful, and those are so expensive in New York. But he'll even see kind of like dramas that have a little bit of action in IMAX 3D, <laughs> just a if hint. he can. It's like oh, I gotta see it in IMAX. I was like, Dad, I don't really think that you need to see. Um, oh shit, what was it? It was really funny. <laughs> Imagine like the wife, <laughs> Glenn Close, <laughs> kicks somebody's ass, IMAX. I'll have to think about it and and come back to you all with it. But it was some it was some drama. It was like it was almost like an indie movie, I think. And I was like, I don't even think that's gonna be an IMAX 3D. But if you truly want it, um, yeah. But anywho, um, yeah. I will say one thing that I kind of want to have as a closing thought for this episode is that Last Airbender not a success in my book. Um, and I like I consider you completing a draft more of a success because it is relative, right? Like M. Night Shyamalan, this big name who fucked up a property that was just gold and, yeah, made money. But, like, how did you fuck it up so bad relative to where you're at? Finishing a script is a big accomplishment, and that is a success. And I mean, Same with selling a painting. Exactly. But here is one thing that I do truly believe about all of our industries and, and our endeavors is that Something especially like a movie. Um, I'm hard on myself, so I don't necessarily think this is about a lot of my paintings, but a lot of paintings that I see and I know the process that artists take. Uh, but I definitely think that people should always be proud of themselves for completing a film. 
or completing a script or completing a painting. Um, yeah. But, but definitely when it comes to a film, there's so many moving pieces and there's oh, so much God, just riding on it. And it's such a big endeavor. Like I have so much respect for directors. Um, I thought I wanted to be a director. I might still get behind the camera again, but I just, I don't even think I can do that. I don't think I can manage so many things at once in one project. Uh, that in itself, people should pat themselves on the back, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a success. So I'll leave you with that cryptic message. Um, cause we do have to wrap it up a bit. Um, yeah. Before we, uh, say goodbye to Brenda, uh, I wanted to introduce something else for this show, which is um, what whoa, <laughs> what whoa, what whoa, what whoa, which is what are they working on? Which is just like we can give shout outs to stuff that um, that has been on our radar and can be of any level of quote unquote success. Um, so what uh, what's what whoa or yeah yeah what whoa. So I want to give a special shout out to my friend Frankie Martinez. He lives in Brooklyn. He is a chanteuse, a singer, songwriter, um, crafts beautiful electronic beats and sings over it. His name on SoundCloud, I'm reading this, is Frank's F-R-A-N-X-X. So check him out. XX, that's uh, pretty raunchy stuff. It's very raunchy. Nice. And it's... uh, Sex sells. It sure does. It does. So get out there and sex it up, and you'll make money. Let's get down tonight. Ray Parker Jr. Um, (laughs) uh, For me, I would like to give a shout out to... Actually, i got to find this guy's name, too. I was reading about it today. (laughs) We're prepared. Um, Not prepared in the (laughs) slightest. Um, Uh. I'll, actually, you just find it. You you go through the effort of finding this guy. I was reading about... <laughs> you I do the work. I, I should definitely find it. Um, I think he just calls himself at Kirby Jenner. <laughs> um, but um, there it is. Found him. Okay, so he's on Instagram, at Kirby Jenner. Uh, he's got a million followers. Wow. And a blue check mark. Oh, my God. I was reading about him when I saw like his 50 best... Uh, shots today that's great he um he (laughs) he (laughs) says he's the the fraternal twin of kendall jenner Uh, you heard it here and uh i mean i don't want to give away the gag but that's kind of the appeal of the whole thing is he's been photoshopping himself into pictures uh with kendall jenner and like the other kardashians uh, for like a year or more or something. And some of them some of them you can kind of tell, but most of them are really, really good. That's cool. And he's also got a Twitter. So on Twitter and Instagram, he's at Kirby Jenner. K-I-R-B-Y-J-E. <laughs> Kirby. Yeah. You know, like the pink guy. <laughs> uh, Jenner, like uh, like the asshole name. And um, yeah. and yeah, I just, I, I applaud him for this endeavor. I Hats off to you, Kirby. I hope it gets him something. I don't know what. You know, these are those, a book like, deal. Yeah. It, I mean, it'd probably be like a gag book at Urban an, Outfitters. An E-True Hollywood story. <laughs> you know, something yeah. something classy. But yeah, so um, hats off to you, Kirby Jenner, yeah. um, or whatever your real name Salute is. Salute you! Salute, like Beyonce. Did she do that? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not going to alienate our audience of five right now by saying my feelings Six. on Beyonce. <laughs> now four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they already sense that it's not good. Um, no, <laughs> I appreciate her. I appreciate her. We're not going to go into a no, I do discussion too. of, Zim- of <laughs> a discussion of Zimbabwe. <laughs> Actually, the capital of Zimbabwe is <laughs> Zimbabwe no. is a mess right now. And if there is any, <laughs> it is though. Donate. It is. I mean, you should really. I mean, this is now a very serious PSA. Check out what's going on in Zimbabwe because it's it's not good and and not enough people know about it. But I didn't want to end on oh. that note. Um, I want to end on uh, on a fun little note that. Uh, that's how we always close out the show with a game of, well, you'll know it. You'll know. Hello, Diane. Hello, Diane. Hello, Diane. Hello, Diane. Hello, D- Dion? Is it Dion? Dion? Dion Warwick, are you there? <laughs> D'Angelo? D'Angelo, hello? 
Hello, D'Angelo. I'm coming in. I'm coming in for my five o'clock. I don't care that I'm early. I'm entering the building. Hello, Diane. Hello, Diane. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, David. Goodbye, Brenda. Goodbye, Brenda. Goodbye, Brenda. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a podcast production for the Okazigo Media Company.